This is section 9.4, Exponential Growth and Decay, Content Objective 2, which is to solve story problems involving the law of exponential change. When we're done, I'd like you to explain how the value of k in the temperature problems relates to whether an object is heating up or cooling down. How does this connect to the graph of the differential equations solution curve? Our first type of story problem that you're going to have to encounter and solve are money problems that involve continuous compounding. With example one, we are told already that this is going to be a story problem involving the law of exponential change. That means buried in the word somewhere, we've got an amount, and the rate at which that amount is changing is proportional to how much is currently present. So if we read this problem, we can see that the quantity that is growing over time is the amount of money. So we know that the rate at which that money is changing is going to be proportional to how much money is currently in the account. And the K is actually the interest rate, so that's the 0 0.0475. Because we recognize this as the law of exponential change, we can go immediately to the solution, which is A equals A initial E to the K times T. And because we were told that we had $500 invested, that is our initial amount. Now the second part of this problem asks us to now use this formula to determine how long it would take for the investment to triple. So that means we're looking for the solution to this equation where the amount that is in the account at the end is 1500 when we started with 500. So if I solve this I will need to divide by 500 then I'll need to log natural both sides and then I'll divide by that 0 0.0475. Put that into your calculator and we end up with 23.129 years. Our second type of problem is to solve growth and decay problems. So for example, let's say we have a colony of bacteria that's growing under ideal conditions. At the end of 8 hours there are 10,000 bacteria and the end of 10 hours there are 50,000 bacteria. So again, we are told that this is a scenario that satisfies the law of exponential change. So that means the number of bacteria at any time will be the number we start with times e to the kt. The unknowns in this scenario are how many bacteria we started with and what that growth rate is, what that constant of proportionality is. So we were given two pieces of information. We were told that when time was 8, we had 10,000 bacteria. We were also told that when time was 10, we had 50,000 bacteria. So if I plug both of those points in, I will get a system of equations that I can then solve. I'll have 10,000 equals an initial e to the k times 8, and I'll have 50,000 equals an initial times e to the k times 10. If I isolate an initial in the top equation, I get 10,000 over e to the 8k. And if I then plug that in and substitute, I'll get 50,000 equals that n initial times e to the 10k. Use properties of exponents to simplify this side, and we'll get 50,000 equals 10,000 e to the 2k, and then if I isolate k, I will divide by 10,000, and then I'll log natural both sides, and then I'll divide by 2. So I'll have k is 1 half the log natural of 5. Part b wants to know how many bacteria were present, so that's our n initial. n initial is going to be 10,000 divided by e to the 8 of these, so that's 4 log naturals of 5. To simplify this without a calculator, we will recall our properties of logarithms that tell us that exterior coefficients are interior exponents, and I'll be able to rewrite that as e to the log natural of 5 to the fourths. Now e's and logs are inverses of each other, so I'll end up with just 10,000 over 5 to the fourth. Well, remember that 10,000 is actually 10 to the 4th, so 10 to the 4th over 5 to the 4th will give us 2 to the 4th, which is 16. So we're going to start with 16 bacteria, 
and our k is 1 half ln of 5. Again, put that t out in front so you don't think it's inside the log. Our third type of story problem that involves this law of exponential change involves temperature. So if we take a very cold object and put it into a heated room, the temperature is going to change very quickly and that cool object will heat up. If on the other hand we take something that is very hot and immerse it in ice water or throw it in a snowbank or take it down to the South Pole, it is going to cool down. So we have this temperature that is changing over time. If we want it to fit the law of exponential change, at first glance we might think that the rate at which the temperature is changing is proportional to the temperature of the object. But that doesn't really make sense because that would mean that cold objects that have a low temperature are always going to have a rate of change that is small, whereas hot objects that have a high temperature would have a rate of change that is large doesn't make sense. So we have to think realistically about what's going on. It is not the temperature of the object that mandates the change or the rate. Instead, it is the difference between the temperature of the object and the surrounding temperature. If you have a very large difference between these, then you're either going to heat up or cool down very quickly. But looking at this, it doesn't seem to match that law of exponential change. So we can't just automatically go to the solution yet. So how I'd like you to think about this is as the rate of change of the difference between the two temperatures. Because if we take the derivative of this, we will get dt dt minus a zero because that surrounding temperature is not going to change. Now I realize on the microscopic small, small level we might have a bit of a bump in the South Pole's temperature if we put a really hot egg on the surface of the South Pole but it's going to be so negligible that we don't need to worry about it. That surrounding temperature essentially is not changing. So it remains constant even though the temperature of the object is changing. So this derivative of the difference between them is actually the same as the derivative of the object's temperature. That means I can rewrite this as the derivative of the difference or the rate of change in the difference is proportional to the difference between those two temperatures. And this now fits the law of exponential change and we can write the solution as the t minus t sub s at any time will be the initial difference between those two temperatures times e to the k t. If I now isolate the temperature of the object at any time, I'm simply adding the surrounding temperature to the right hand side of the equation. This is called Newton's law of cooling. And notice that if k is a positive number, then this will be getting larger as time goes on, which means the temperature will be increasing. If k is a negative number, then this will be getting smaller as time goes on, which means that the temperature will be getting smaller and the object will be cooling. With our example now, we have a cup of soup that's cooling from 90 degrees to 60 degrees in a mere 10 minutes in a room whose temperature is 20 degrees. And the first question is, how much longer will it take for the soup to cool to 35 degrees? So the first thing we'll do is we will write down that general formula for Newton's law of cooling, which is the temperature of the object at any time will be the surrounding temperature plus the difference between the initial temperature and the surrounding times e to the kt. If I plug in what I know for this particular problem, I have an initial temperature of 90 and I have a room temperature of 20. So I can write that the temperature at any time will be the surrounding temperature of 20 plus the initial temperature which is 90 minus the surrounding temperature times e to the kt. And I can see that if I simplify, I will only have one variable remaining and that variable is going to be the k. So I was given another piece of information that I haven't used yet, which is the 60 degrees in 10 minutes. So that's actually a point on the temperature curve. It tells me when time is 10, I get a temperature of 60. So if I plug that in, I'll get 60 equals 20 plus 70 e to the k times 10. Solving this equation will enable me to figure out what k is. I subtract 20 first, that gives me 40. 
then I divide by the 70, then I log both sides, and then I divide by 10. So I end up with a k that is 1 tenth times the log natural of 4 sevenths. Now I have a formula that I can use for any other time to find any other temperature. So I'll have 20 plus 70 times e to the 1 tenth log natural of 4 sevenths, and I'm going to put that t in front so that I don't accidentally include it in the log. Now that, now that I have the temperature, I'm ready to answer the question. I want to know how much longer it takes to cool to 35 degrees. So that means my final temperature is going to be 35, and my goal is to figure out what t is. So I can either pull out my calculator or I can isolate my t first and then compute it on the calculator. I would need to subtract 20, that gives me 15. Then I would divide by 70. Then I'd log both sides and then I would divide by this exponent. Put that into the calculator and I end up with a time of 27.527. Now the question was not how long does it take to cool down to 35. The question was how much longer is it going to take after it's already cooled down to 60. So that means we'd need to subtract 10 from this and we would write it will take 17.527 more minutes to cool down to 35 degrees Celsius. Now if we read part B, it says the K that you found in part A is related to the specific heat of the soup. Now if you're taking chemistry at all, I think they might even talk about it in physics, we have objects that have specific heats. In fact, every object has a specific heat. Its ability to change temperature is related to the chemical composition of the object, and that does not change regardless of what the interior or exterior temperatures are. So that specific heat is very closely linked to the value of K. So it's not going to change, so that means this K that we found in part A we can use for the second problem, which is to determine how long it will take that same cup of soup that started at 90 degrees to cool down to 35 if instead of being put into a room it was put into a freezer whose temperature was negative 15. So we have the same basic temperature template for our equation and we know in this case that the surrounding temperature is negative 15. The initial temperature is still 90 and the K we found up above was 1 tenth times the log natural of 4 sevenths. So now we have our formula. The question is what's the time going to be when the temperature is 35? So we'll put a 35 in for the temperature and then we'll isolate the T. We'll add 15, we'll divide by 105, we'll log both sides and then we'll divide by that 1 tenth the log natural of 4 sevenths. Put that into your calculator and you'll end up with 13.258 minutes. Our final problem type involves coasting. So in some cases it's reasonable to assume that with other forces are absent, the resistance encountered by a moving object will be proportional to how fast that object is moving. Physics tells us that the force equals the mass times acceleration. And if you recall, acceleration is the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. So we can rewrite the assumption that force is proportional to that velocity by writing the mass times the acceleration. So here's that mass times acceleration there's our force, is proportional to the velocity. Now in this case I put a negative in front because no matter what, when you're coasting the velocity is going to decrease. So we know that that coefficient or that proportionality constant is going to be a negative number. If we now work with this we can see that we can fit the law of exponential change by isolating dv dt so we get the rate at which that velocity is changing is proportional to the velocity. So if I write my solution now using the shortcut the law of exponential change provides, we get the velocity at any time will be the initial velocity times e to that proportionality constant times t. 
A common question that will be asked in scenarios like this is, how far will the object coast before coming to a complete stop? So we know the standard equation for the velocity at any time will be v equals v initial e to the negative k over m times t. And most people will start to answer this question by saying, oh, well, if I'm at a complete stop, then I know the velocity is going to be zero. So I would try to solve this equation using my typical algebraic techniques. I would divide by v initial and I'd get zero. And then I would log both sides in order to get that t out of the exponent and oh, I'm going to run into a problem. And the reason I'm going to run into a problem is that log of zero does not exist. So this method is not going to work for us. So instead we need to back up and think about the true question which is how far. When we're asking how far, we're asking for information about position. And we know that velocity is the derivative of the position. So what we really have here is a differential equation involving the position function. So in order to solve it, we can separate our variables and then integrate both sides and we'll get the position at any time will be the constant in front times exponentials going backwards stay the same and then we divide by the derivative of the inside because it is a constant. We're doing the shortcut for substitution method and then we add a c. Now because we know when we start coasting that we haven't coasted anywhere, we have an initial point or an initial condition on the position curve. When time is zero, we've gone nowhere. So if I plug that in, it will enable me to solve for c. And let's keep in mind that dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. And if I plug zero in up here, then we can solve for c to yield v initial times m over k. That means my position function now will be a negative v initial times the mass of the coasting object over that proportionality constant k times e to the negative k over m times t plus that constant. And now we're prepared to answer the question, how far will the object coast? That means we let time go to infinity. And we're looking at the limit of that position curve. If I let time go to infinity, this exponent gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, we will get something that will create this entire term going to zero. So we'll end up with a v initial times m over k. So this is my coasting distance. It's my initial velocity times my mass over k. And notice too that that m over k is simply the reciprocal of this number right here. So our example of this, we have a 50 kilogram skater. I tell you what k is and this skater is coasting on the ice. The question is how long will it take for her velocity to decrease from 7 meters per second to 1 meters per second. So in this case we have our velocity at any time equals v initial times e to the negative k over m times t. If I plug in what I know I have the initial velocity is 7. I know her mass is 50. I know k is 2.5 and I have a t. So if I now want to decrease to 1 meter per second then I'm going to be solving this equation. Use your calculator to compute and we get t equals 38.918 seconds. If we want to do part b, which is how far will she coast before coming to a complete stop, we remember that that coasting distance from earlier is v initial times m over k. So in this case, it is our initial velocity of 7 times the mass of the skater divided by k, which is 2.5. Simplify that and you end up with 140 meters.